And as folks are doing, as you come in, you're welcome to introduce yourselves in the chat. Let us know where you're coming from, where you are today. It's great to see people joining from um, all around the world. Great. And with that, I think we're going to get started. So welcome, everyone. My name is Jennifer Swift Morgan. I'm a senior advisor for governance and education here at Chemonics International. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to this event, Redefining Local Capacity Strengthening. Um, as you all will see today, we'll be joined by a number of speakers, um, and most importantly, a panel of leaders of organizations working in their own communities and countries around the world um, who are already leading change um, for, for the folks that they serve. And this is part of a larger dialogue on locally led development, and in particular, the implementation of USAID's local capacity strengthening policy, which came out in 2022 after a long process of development that was pretty participatory around the world. And our, our goal today is to place local leaders at the forefront of this discussion. What does this policy mean to them? Particularly as we talk about this concept of redefining capacity strengthening. Um, it was a really uh, important and intentional um, note to, to talk about capacity strengthening now versus capacity building, for instance. And as you'll see from our panel today, there's a real reason behind that. There is immense capacity already in these organizations who are doing incredibly important work in their communities. And so we want to hear from them. What, is this, what does this policy mean to them? But more importantly, how are they defining success? Um, how are they, you know, what are their aspirations for partnerships moving forward? And so today um, we'll start with um, some opening remarks from a representative from USAID in the office, um, the Center for Democracy, Rights and Governance. And then we will be turning to this panel and we'll end with a discussion from discussions from both USAID and from Chemonics. I want to let everyone know that we do have simultaneous translation happening. There's instructions in the chat. So please um, choose the channel that works best for you. And we do really want to make this very interactive. And so if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A function um, in the webinar. And so um, for no, with no further ado, I'm going to um, first introduce our first speaker. Um, her name is Laura Pavlovich, and she is the Deputy Director of Democracy Rights and Governance Center at USAID Washington. Um, welcome, Laura. We're really thrilled to have you today. And I should mention that this um, event, in some ways, is a follow-on to an event yesterday that we had at um, CID US that also talked about um, locally-led development. And I think today will be a, an opportunity to go a little bit deeper into how that gets operationalized, and again, hear from folks who are running national and local organizations in their own countries and communities and see what this policy means to them and how we can all work better to support the great work they're doing. So over to you, Laura, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jen, um, and thank you for having me. I am really looking forward um, to our panelists' presentations and to the discussion this morning. So as, as Jen's mentioned, I've been asked to give some opening remarks on the shifts that we're seeking within USAID um, to support local actors through our new local capacity strengthening policy and the implications that it will have for all of us working on democracy, human rights, and governance issues. So first and foremost, how do we get here? The past 20 years have really seen sustained focus and commitments from aid effectiveness decrees in Paris, Accra, and Busan to the development of the Sustainable Development Goals on refocusing our development assistance on strengthening local capacity and ownership as central to our efforts to achieve sustainable development. But from where I sit, the democracy rights and governance sector, DRG sector, has been going through a related and parallel evolution over the past several years. Over time, our sector has shifted its focus from the institutional parts of democracy, so regular elections, written constitutions, legislation on freedom of speech and assembly, 
to a much greater focus on the practices and norms that really underpin democratic societies. So access to equitable and timely justice, pluralistic and vibrant civil societies. That means that democracy is going to exist in diverse ways, each particular to its society. And this shift has really tracked with an increasing awareness across the DRG sector that the challenges to democracy that we see today are not because of a lack of good models. The key challenge to democratic consolidation is more often political or economic elites that are vested in the status quo and block attempts at reform. So the nature of that challenge is going to look different from place to place. And our ability as development professionals to support democratic development in the countries in which we work really depends more on our ability to understand the context in which we work, why politics works the way that it does, and the local actors with the capacities and interests to drive meaningful change. So overall, our work within the DRG sector has come to place less emphasis on what our partners can achieve in a project and much more on how we can support them as they deal with shocks and really take advantage of opportunities to advance democracies in ways that make sense in their societies. And we're coming to understand that our contribution to democratic development is really about how we support the right local actors to build on their visions to, and be positioned them to respond and adapt over time. And this really fits perfectly with the agency's USAID's definition of localization, which is the process and actions that we are taking to ensure that our work puts local actors in the lead, strengthens local systems, and is responsive to local communities. So what does this new policy mean for these efforts? So the policy really reflects emerging consensus, as I've mentioned, about the importance of support for locally led programming to sustainable development. And as I've mentioned, we've also seen this in our own evolution within the DRG sector. More and more, the democratic development depends on local leadership and how we support and show up for local leaders and processes that can best advance democratic norms and, and values in that context. But despite this consensus, we've never had a unified agency policy on local capacity strengthening. So this policy was really developed to build on this consensus and evidence, as well as our collective experience in fostering locally led development. Overall, the new policy reframes our local capacity strengthening work in a number of ways that align closely with the shifts that we've seen within the DRG sector over the past several years. First of all, the policy moves us towards a much more multifaceted approach to strengthening local systems. The new policy defines local capacity strengthening as strategic and intentional investment in the process of partnering with local actors. So not just organizations or individuals, but also networks that would work together to jointly improve the, the functioning of a local system to produce locally valued and sustainable development results. So this approach is designed to move us beyond a focus on individual organizations and awards and toward a focus on how our collective efforts can improve the performance of local systems and complement the work that we do to strengthen local capacity with the work to strengthen networks, to develop, and policy, to develop policies and to convene and build coalitions that will be needed to truly sustain results. Secondly, the policy will accelerate efforts that the DRG sector has long undertaken to more deeply understand power in politics and the local actors who are currently left out of democratic and socioeconomic development programming. At the same time, the policy also recognizes a number of ways that our efforts to engage and strengthen our partnerships with these communities and groups can potentially involve special risks especially for groups that may not have access to legal protections or even individual or community recognition in the contexts in which we're working. In addition, the policy recognizes that in many contexts in which we work, our local partners, partnerships with us can affect their roles within a local system. It can impact vested interests. It can reinforce entrenched inequalities or create or exacerbate conflict. 
all dynamics that we in the DRG sector are really aware of because of all the work that we do at the intersection of politics and power. Moreover, in the, uh, the large amount of consultations with our local partners that led up to the development of the policy, we heard over and over again that direct awards with USAID in the past have sometimes over-focused on compliance with our regulations, long registration processes, short-term results, and a focus on short-term results, or the achievement of USAID's objectives that may shift with budget cycles or shift with administrations. All of this increases the dependence of local actors on international donors and can weaken their resilience because of the, 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 the effects that it has of stifling local revenue generation and undermining relationships with constituents. So in order to address this challenge, the local capacity strengthening policy really says that decision-making on whether or not to support local capacity strengthening through direct or indirect awards to local partners should be grounded in an understanding of whether this approach will actually contribute to overall systems change and really approaches our capacity strengthening efforts in terms of mutuality, the extent to which partnering directly with us can actually you know, help to support our local partners of objectives. And this recognizes the fact that ultimately our aim with this is to support locally led development and that direct partnerships are in part of a much larger effort that we have underway to develop programming that strengthens networks, local resources, and local collective action. So as you'll see in the implementation guidance for the policy, USAID is setting a 25% target for local direct awards across our agency, but we're setting a 50% target for a local voice and really the ways in which we are programming to engage directly and responsively to local challenges and local initiative. That's a target to which all of us, but especially those of us working in the DRG sector, have a lot to contribute. So what does the policy mean for us in the DRG sector? So the DRG sector has frameworks and interventions that we see as critical to our ability, USAID's ability to advance implementation of this policy. First and foremost, as a longtime adherent and promoter of USAID's political economy analysis and local systems frameworks and our efforts to think and work politically, I was really excited to see the focus in the new policy on focusing our local capacity strengthening efforts on how local actors interact within a local system and how political, economic, social, or environmental factors can influence how change happens within those systems. That thinking is very much aligned with the way that we think about political economy analysis and thinking and working politically. So our sector and the analyses that we use to ground our work and the interventions that we've developed to take this work forward over the past decades will really be key tools for our agency and our local international and multilateral partners as we advance the implementation of this policy. But I wanted to highlight one other really critical factor, which is the fact that the local capacity strengthening policy is also going to ask us to shift and redouble our efforts in another really important respect. For more than a decade now, our sector, along with others, has been challenged to consider how we move beyond analyzing how political systems work in the countries where we're working and finding ways to work with the grain in those systems. The new policy is challenging all of us to advance approaches that instead really hone in on how social exclusion in the countries in which we operate affects our ability to advance equitable and sustainable outcomes and to shift the power in the countries in which we're operating and to expand our networks and create new ones and deploy our role as, a, as an assistance provider and our resources within these systems to really rebalance the, the power asymmetries that may exist within a system. So what's next? The policy requires DRG as well as other technical sectors to develop implementation guidance that really focus on how we are going to implement the principles that the policy sets forward. And we'll also be thinking through the ways in which we can be supporting here in Washington sector-wide efforts to foster locally led development as part of our conceptualization of a new Democracy Rights and Governance Bureau here in Washington. 
And we're already advancing this approach across the DRG sector. And so I wanted to highlight three processes that you may have heard about at the Second Summit for Democracy um, at the end of March. First and foremost, our new rule of law policy, which I know our colleagues at Commonics will be, uh, will be discussing in the weeks ahead as well, is really putting a premium on better understanding the needs and experiences of justice seekers, solving people's everyday legal problems, and engaging and empowering local communities in justice reform. This approach, which is known as people-centered justice, is rooted in a lot of evidence that demonstrates that trust can be built by changing how government engages the people it serves. But understanding how justice systems function, engaging justice users in problem identification, and local reformers in addressing them is really at the core of this approach. In our civil society work, USAID is increasingly focused on promoting network-based approaches and coalition building rather than supporting specific organizations or advocacy campaigns. And you see this approach reflected in the new Powered by the People program, which focuses on engaging informal groups, activists, human rights defenders, researchers, to build platforms where these groups can learn from one another and where we can be providing the support that they need to really advance civic participation. And finally, our Partnerships for Democratic Development program will support reformers in countries that are experiencing democratic openings. And I'm particularly excited about this one because it really fills a gap in our assistance and providing flexible multi-year assistance to support reformers in really developing inclusive reform processes together with local civil society, local private sector, and other stakeholders. And really our role is to support these actors in developing partnerships to identify key development challenges that either could curtail or extend a democratic breakthrough and to really work with these local actors to utilize and strengthen democratic processes and institutions to address these challenges so that we are deepening development as well as democratic processes. But I wanted to leave you with a, all with a with a with a an invitation to further discussion. Ultimately, our ability to take this approach forward will depend on our ability to provide really clear guidance, take on board the challenges that we all are experiencing in advancing these approaches, integrate these approaches into our programming across sectors and contexts, and adapt as we learn. So the experience of everyone here today, your expertise and your perspectives are really critical to us within USAID. And we're really looking forward to continuing to engage you in the months ahead as we move forward into implementation. And again, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, there are so many things that resonate with, with me personally. I know with our team here at Commonics of what you said and that we're gonna hear reflected, I think in the panel, um, we've already had some really great discussions with, this, with these organizations and preparing this event. Some of the things that really resonate this this question of um, how to move beyond projects or traditional project approaches, right? And how do we support organizations and their networks and coalitions um, over, over several years and recognize the work they're already doing, whether that's in a project format or not, and continue to, 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 um, to strengthen that coalition building. The fact that <clears throat> one of the greatest strengths that these, these organizations have is oftentimes already a mastery of the political economy in their own countries and, and contexts, right? And so um, this question of getting, going with the grain, they often have found those grains um, that work with others of like, like-minded organizations and individuals to, to, to really get to change um, in ways that this question of how change happens in that particular context, these organizations already know how to do that. Um, for in a, in a great extent, um, this question of mutuality, right? Um, how to get to much more of a peer-to-peer -peer relationship, right? So it's not just about foreign assistance, it's about international cooperation um, in a way that's really formed around, around these more peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Um, so I think we're gonna hear a lot of those themes reflected in what these folks have to say to us today. So that's really great. Thanks, Laura. We have time for one question. Um, I, verbally, and then we were, we're inviting you to, to answer all additional questions that may come through the Q&A. 
So um, I know it's it's relatively new, this announcement of not just the 25% money being shifted to local organizations. There's been a global call for not just shifting money, but shifting power, which the administrator herself has said, right? And so this new target um, of 50% of activities, including local voice or local leadership, can you say a little bit more about the, the framework that's developing on how to measure that? Yes, absolutely. So I do not want to get out ahead of my colleagues um, working in the lift hub who are working on finalizing this guidance. But um, I think what I can say at this point is that we are looking at a variety of different ways of measuring this, recognizing again that local capacity strengthening and the ways in which we are, you know, kind of engaging and focusing our work on local initiative is going to vary greatly from context to context. So it could be local engagement in the design process, local engagement in the process of procuring a new award. So there will be a number of ways in which missions can be measuring against this target. And we're actually looking forward to kind of sharing the full definition of, of what qualifies um, in the weeks ahead. Terrific. Thanks. Well, thank you again. Um, again, I invite you to, to answer any other questions that come through the Q&A um, and to stick around and for as long as you can to hear what others are saying. Of course, this is being recorded. And we know that this is an ongoing dialogue with your center, particularly how these things are implemented in the DG sector. Um, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thanks, Laura. And with that, um, I'm really thrilled to, to introduce and to welcome on camera our panelists for today. Um, this is really the what we think is sort of the most important part of this event is uh, hearing from you all. Um, you've heard a lot of things in, in what USAID now is planning in terms of policy around locally led development and specifically in the DRG sector, um, what, that, what that might look like moving forward. Now we want to hear from you all. Um, so it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our three panelists from today, and you'll see there um, their bios um, being included in the chat. First, we have Maroon Kesh, who's the founder of AO, um, AWFA or AFWA in Lebanon, um, who is also an associate professor of ancient Near Eastern studies. He's joining us from his community there in Lebanon. And then we also have Ruslan um, Tormosov, who is the executive director for the Municipal Development Institute, MDI, in Ukraine. And we have Li Hongmin, who is um, on the board of um, for foundation management for Startup Vietnam, um, SVF, um, joining us as well. We are so thrilled to have you all. Um, and what we're going to do is we'll start with some introductions where each, um, each uh, leader today will introduce their organization, tell us a bit about how they came to be, what success means for them. So we'll give each of them um, a few minutes to introduce themselves, and then we'll go around with some more questions, digging into these questions about what locally led development actually means for you all. And so Maroon, we're gonna start with you. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm honored to be among you today. Um, I would like to thank Kamenix International for this great opportunity. And also I would like to thank Ms. Alice Azar from CSP Lebanon for trusting us. I'll be speaking on behalf of Alpha organization. Uh, Alpha is a, a stands for Activist Working for Ainibel. It's a Lebanese local NGO founded in 2008. Ainibel is a Lebanese village in southern Lebanon, some kilometer away from the Lebanese-Israeli border. It's a tense region with recurrent conflicts. Therefore, it's subject to United Nations resolutions, such as the 1701, as well as the presence of a peacekeeping mission, mission labeled the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, present since 1978. During Israel's war in Lebanon in 2006, the village of Hainabel was partially destroyed and most, most of its population displaced for the time of the war. During and, in the, during and in the aftermath of the war, a group of youth dedicated themselves to provide aid for those who had been displaced, securing shelter, food, and other basic necessities. As soon as the war ended, they took it upon themselves to clean up the village, removing the debris of destruction and ensuring that basic necessities were available for the safe return of those who had been displaced. However, the lack of legal framework was a hindrance which led to the idea of forming an NGO. Hence, uh, Alpha was born. Um, our vision is to ensure sustainable and rural development in Ainibel and in the surrounding areas. 
And our mission is to empower the local community to enhance the quality of life in their village by addressing their the, the diverse needs. We strive to prevent migration to urban areas and to promote the growth and prosperity of the community through our initiatives, providing them with the necessary resources and support to achieve self-sufficiency and sustainable development. Our um, objective is actually to contribute to the welfare of the community by designing and implementing quality projects in this rural area, by providing ideas and projects related to sustainable and responsible development, cultural and heritage preservation, protecting the environment, and supporting the youth. 15 years later, AUFA's members are still dedicated as they were on day one. We all continue to volunteer our time to this day. We believe that all funds raised should be invested in addressing the community's need, and we also believe that civic engagement is essential for everyone. It helps to generate a sense of identity and belonging. On the other hand, volunteering does have limitation, as a full-time engagement would likely yield better result. Therefore, we have started exploring the possibility of hiring a full-time staff to overcome this challenge. Studying the idea, we're still uh, uh, studying it. So I would like to stress out that our project or inputs never overlap on the public institution duty. In our case, the municipality. In Lebanon, municipalities have small governmental funds and those funds disappeared with the economic crisis that hit Lebanon starting 2020. So we had to double, double our efforts in order to support the municipality. So success for us is any on or every positive impact or a welfare improvement brought to the local community, regardless of the scale of the project, whether it's a couple of hundreds of dollars or even several thousands. So our engagement toward the community can be summed up, but not limited to the following two projects. The Rabainibel a hiking trail designed and implemented by AUFA it was funded by the USAID through the Community Support Program. The main purpose was to preserve our, and to promote our archaeological and cultural heritage and to preserve the nature surrounding the village. Second one is a very big one, is a waste sorting from the source and recycling. This project was designed by AUFA, but it was implemented in a joint venture between the municipality and AUFA. Implemented on several steps, it was funded by several donors since we couldn't have access to a fully funded project. Therefore, we divided it into small milestones and we proceeded accordingly. Alpha assembled the project and by the end, it handed over to the municipality. Both projects had quick and immediate impact on the community and on the environment. Uh, the sorting and recycling project created about five jobs, allowing five families to remain in the village and the sorted material uh, between five to six tons per month. And this number can be doubled or tripl tripled in summer is sold by the municipality, allowing it to generate extra money for its needs. Thank you. Thank you so much. And one reason we wanted to start with you, Marun, is that um, we have such a diversity of organizations here. And I think Alpha really shows us the kind of impact you can have at such a local level, responding to very specific aspirations and specific needs of communities in ways that no one else really can. Right. And also this complementarity that you're talking about between the nonprofit sector, NGOs, right, and and the municipalities and local government that is, it's, it's, these, this is part of the ecosystem, in fact, that that Laura was talking about earlier. Right. And how do we strengthen the entire system of folks that are simply working to make lives better um, for their communities? And I think um, some really, really great examples of that, and it was such a privilege for us, for, for Comonics to be able to, to work with you all and, and, and provide a little boost or um, simply that sort of networking needed to, to go an extra mile and to do to have the kind of impact you're having. So thank you so much. Um, and with that, we're gonna shift to, again, another type of organization working on a, a different scale. And working at a different scale. Um, and for that, we're gonna turn it over to you, Ruslan. Um, to talk about NGI's work in Ukraine. I represent all Ukrainian Municipal Development Institute. It was established in 2004. It was established with the framework of the project that was financed by USAID. And that 
was aimed on, on reforming a utility uh, sector in Ukraine and development of social economical development in Ukraine and of cities and regions. And, and so a group of leading uh, specialists in this year was uh, established this uh, organization as, as part of the project that was uh, financed by UCD and was implemented by Pesco company. And the task of was to ensure the sustainability of what was done by the project. And namely that after the end of the project, the, we need to have organization, local organization that could pick up all these school practices and continue to do, to implement them in Ukraine. It was achieved. This is since 2004, MDI has been working successfully and constantly increasing its presence and uh, works in the area of implementing utility reforms. But over this time, the area was, uh, was increased and now we have we're working there so sustainable development cities, energy development, energy security, the climate change, uh, public engagement, uh, educational project, etc. So we managed to to implement what was implemented by the initial project. We managed to extend the activity and we by cooperating with legislature uh, with other partners in not only USAD, we continued to work. We continue to work for the benefit of Ukraine for the benefit of sustainable development. We implemented, uh, we shared more than 20 projects, including three projects. And the project, uh, the budget of this of three projects exceeded to two, two million US dollars. And in one project was the direct corporate agreement with USAID. And so we became better. In a number of activities, including the I work with the with with homeowners associations in Ukraine, in public engagement, technical assistance, and consulting to utility companies, uh, water supply, heat supply companies, etc. We introduced various educational programs for students, and this is there is the outcome of the. That um, that was uh, that became like possible because thanks to the USAID uh, assistance, and now MDI has been working with 50 professional consultants and work in the areas that I have uh, that I mentioned earlier with 20 plus years of experience, which over the so together with Kimonix as part of the DJ East project. That was initiated by Pimonix and funded by UC Ukraine. We successfully, regardless of the war, uh, completed the Good, Good Neighbors One Country project. And uh, this project is uh, in time of war, was the, like a sip of fresh air for the communities who. who on the, who are experiencing significant problems, issues in the utility sector and, and in cooperation with local government, etc. We implemented great, great tasks, and I can name, I can just uh, drop a figure, uh, like 98% 98 the educational institutions, 93 educational materials, whatever it is. On the on the relevant issues for Ukrainian citizens were developed. This is we managed to 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 do everything on under shelling and in times of air raids and uh, cooperating with with super team of chemonics that is implementing DG's project in Ukraine. This is just this is just briefly about us and our success story. Ruslan, thank you so much. And again, as I said, we we have um, a real diversity of experiences here um, that you all represent. I mean, one of the things I take away from so the origin story of MDI and where you've been, where you've reached now, you were doing all of this work already. Um, you know, a number of specialists were coming together for municipal development in Ukraine. 
And when you had an opportunity to get more funding, you were already positioned to really to really expand. And also, um, as you've talked about, you were in the right position to be able to pivot um, and to do more and to and to adapt when the war when the war hit, right? And that's again because of the standing that you already had, the expertise, the 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 resources, the people that you had, the understanding of the community needs. Municipal needs don't go away just because you're being, you're you're in a war situation, right? Um, and I think that again illust illustrates what Laura was talking about. You get beyond sort of the project to project mindset and talk about reinforcing the work you're doing. When something terrible, terrible happens, you are the local leaders there who can then do something about it, right? And to be able to continue working where nobody else would be able to have that kind of success. And again, it's a real it's a real privilege for us to be able to work with you all and to do whatever we can simply to 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 let you all do your work better and more. So thank you so much for that example. And we'll have again more time in the discussion to dig into some of this. Thank you, Ruslan. And finally, over to you, Min, to tell us a bit about the origins um, of SBF. Um, such an interesting organization working in um, intersections between a lot of different actors in the ecosystem around economic growth there in Vietnam. Over to you, Min. Good evening from Vietnam. I'm very honored to be here today. I'm from SBF, uh, founder of SBF. We are an NGO, NPO organized uh, and founded in Vietnam by uh, intellectuals and businessmen and women in Vietnam. We all shared a goal of wanting to bring about breakthrough for Vietnam. At the beginning, the funds came mostly from our own people. We have volunteers who uh, volunteered and um, and sponsored for the resources, for the infrastructures, for the competitions that we had. And then we worked with YBI, uh, the first international donor that we had. And we were uh, also later on very honored to be working with USAID and Chemonix. And up until now, we are a partner and a contractor for a few um, international organization like uh, Standard Charter or Meta or Google. And we are continuing to providing uh, development for Vietnam, for Laos, for Thailand. We are right now focusing on four pillars. Uh, overall, we want to build, to strengthen local capacity. First, we focus on local officials. Uh, in building their capacity, in strategizing um, and building up plans. And we work with 30 provinces. And there are provinces that we worked with that for seven years consecutively. Second, we strengthen capacity for businesses in terms of um, innovation, governance, uh, management for 15,000 people now. And thirdly, we support. Um, business supporting organizations, incubators, accelerators. Um, mostly we want, uh, these are the organizations that would support businesses and startups. And finally, we focus on the youth. We are preparing uh, a new generation of human resources with adequate competence and values that would later on serve local businesses. The values that we have for our communities are third, to pioneer innovation. And from that, we will have um, development. And second, we want to focus on um, mutuality, on supporting one another among provinces. And thirdly, to co-build um, sustainable development. And through our journey, we have we continue to, to create generations and generations of business people who cares about development, sustainability, job creation, uh, society development. 
that's the end of my sharing and introduction. Thank you. And thank you so much. Um, and I think that SVF just has such an interesting, again, origins and, and sort of journey, right? So, and it's similar to, to Alpha, and actually similar to, to MDI in that these were organizations that came up organically from a real interest of people working in their communities, right? In your case, you're talking about business people seeing the interest that it'd be good for all of us if there was someone supporting startups and supporting economic growth, right? And so initial donations and engagement from people with means and people with interest in their own community, um, which is so interesting. And then growing from that, um, one of the things I love about, about your story is that um, you are important capacity strengtheners in your own ecosystem. And I think we forget about that sometimes in the international dynamic that each of your organizations, yes, perhaps we would like to strengthen your capacity to do more work, to amplify, to do better work, but you all are absolutely capacity strengtheners in your own ecosystems, right? So in your case, whether it's working with smaller organizations or municipalities, but even in the case of grassroots in, in Lebanon, strengthening capacity of community members to do more in their communities, right? Um, and all of that's really important. Also, this question, again, of, of mutuality. Mutuality is not just about between international organizations and yours. It, it, that's, that's the kind of collaboration that you all are trying to build in your own and you are building in your own in your own communities right and getting to simply better society better well-being for more people through that kind of collaboration so thank you so much for each of those introductions and now we're going to go around um and ask to ask you all a, a few questions to kind of dig into this a little bit more um and the first question i have for you all is you know you all have your own your own um, ambitions your own aspirations some of you all probably think all of you have your own strategic plans for your organization so how do you see your own priorities and goals reflected in the funding and the donor funding that you might receive and the projects that might come along um, right so you have your work going on and um, if you were to close your eyes and say, I would just like to continue working on these things that we have as our priority. How does that match or not match with the available funding that often comes um, on a project to project basis? And for that, I think um, I think I'll start off with you, Marun. Thank you. Uh, well, we are a very small NGO with very limited resource incomes. So this fact obliges us to uh, relay mainly on donors. Um, prior to 2020, and I'm taking 2020 as example because this is the year that the economic crisis hit Lebanon. So prior to 2020, our focus was on promoting tourism in the village by safeguarding and highlighting its cultural heritage and its archaeological heritage, while also preserving uh, preserving the nature. This is what led us to um, to work with the USAID. However, due to the severe impact of the Lebanese economic crisis on the population, Alpha has to adapt its priorities in response to the evolving needs of the community. In fact, donors have also taken into account the current realities of the Lebanese situation, which, which, which has led to a shift in their priorities. So in this context, Alpha had to reinvent itself and adjust the to the changing needs of the community. So we adapted our priorities in response to the evolving needs, and Alpha began to prioritize projects um, that could generate revenue, particularly in the field of agriculture. This, this sector, the agricultural sectors, was also targeted by donors. So um, in 2020, we were in the process of establishing a hiking trail when the economic hit. So we didn't want to abandon the hiking trail. In the same time, we wanted to provide a source of income to the community uh, by initiating agricultural projects. So um, what we did is actually we um, combined the agricultural aspect with the touristic uh, aspect that we were working on by working on agrotourism. So in this way, we didn't lose funds that we had previously, but also we're targeting new funds, working in the same time, merging them together in order to go also with the donors, but also with the needs of the community. Right, so interesting. So in that case, I and mean, we've talked about this, I mean, Lebanon was facing multiple crises at the same time and sequentially, right? And so in this case, there was both an adaptation of, of what AFA was able to do, but it sounds like maybe a fairly well, good alignment with also donors shifting at the same time. 
um, and perhaps all adapting and, and 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 coming together for some good synergies, which is a which is a good success case the story. Donors are that, always aware case. of the situation, so right, right. they were understanding. <laughs> we adapted, and we had to adapt to them alongside. Excellent, that's great. It doesn't always work out quite so well where there's such synergies. No um, and let's hear from Ruslan, you know, your your experience in terms of this alignment or perhaps not always great between your priorities and goals and the available funding. Well, indeed, we have our priorities, considering that that in the area where we're we've been working for more than 20 years in, in our special experts uh, our our practice our officers are related to the activity organization and uh, undoubtedly we we've been we've been able to in, to impact the activity of international assistance projects that work in our country, and since since we since we're leaders in some activities such activities as, as energy efficiency or our utility sector, the local development, so organizations, the American organizations, the implementers of, of the international project that have been financed by USAID, they took us they took us in their constructions and and we continuously were have been working for more than 10 years in this sector and therefore we we understood the problems the challenges how should be they tackled how do it in a systemic way step by step and and we and but now we have war and the priorities of the uh, international technical assistance have shifted significantly. Everything is aimed on 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 the practical sphere, like humanitarian aid or or assistance in uh, in supply and uh, equipment, electrical generators, and systemic work has stopped in Ukraine. But this trend uh, was obvious even before the war, and and. Uh, the project, international project, uh, really included consortium with uh, consistent on Ukrainian organizations that are leaders in their respective sectors, and and that gave uh, significant uh, gave significant advantages uh, for, for a bit stage of application for grants, but but starting 2018 2019. The trend has changed, and now instead of working with the organizations that are, that have have experience, uh, staff, and confidence of and connections with the local government and central government, now we, the system has changed, and we and projects projects are hard like separate uh, experts. With various practices, with various experiences, and uh, so instead of instead of systemic work, they announced well, in one year or year and a half at the beginning of the project after developing respect to uh, grant manuals, after uh, after getting acquainted with the situation, they announced small grants for resolving some um, pinpoint. Uh, Problems and, and so in my it's in my personal opinion this it has it uh, and in my opinion shared by many experienced experts in Ukraine so it disrupted the system the systemic approach in providing international technical assistance from U state in Ukraine and uh, in our area. Especially with the beginning of the war, when you no, know, when we have completed the uh, heat season in Ukraine, and that when the utility companies, the local government, they all in good 
in the uh, in the context of limited to injury, so in the context of the personal issues, because some of the personal is now uh, uh, enlisted as uh, as as uh, competence, and they they required significant uh, assistance, legislative assistance, technical assistance, and in such and the, and the project that provides such assistance, they are not existing in Ukraine. They they are not present in Ukraine. Like like they they, pro, they so. So, giving us, uh, you know, bad or generators will not help us to resolve our problems. No. So, so, it's impossible to do everything instead of, uh, instead of Ukraine, because the Ukrainians themselves should do something. But to do that, we need a systemic approach and systemic uh, support of our cities. So this situation is... Uh, situation is that we were trying to to tackle this issue whenever it's possible as part of Good Neighbors One Country project. The, we, modif we have modified our activity. We have we have uh, coordinated with the Harmonic DGS project. We managed to do something in this area. We developed chatbots. We cooperated with respective specialists. We conducted a lot of training sessions. We designed respective materials. To make sure that lo local uh, uh, local communities, uh, local government uh, people can do something to improve the situation, but it's just a, it's a drop in the sea. It's not a systemic approach. But what we could do, given our resources, and although our, although the general overall goal of the project was different, but we have to modify our priorities. I can give an example. If I if you can, can give me two or three minutes, I can give an example. Of the difference between the project approach, when we have uh, two, three years, or four years of project time, and uh, versus versus, and in and we the organization, the local organization has a systemic approach and so, so a successful story implemented such a project in uh, in. In the in 2019, as part of the reform of the local utility uh, sector in Ukraine, we had some work. Uh, we did. Uh, we developed this one training training course for school students in the area of energy uh, energy efficiency. So because students are agents of influence for their parents, if students learn something new, they can tell them to their parents. And so when they become adults, uh, the, the school children uh, will will be able to use these uh, competencies when they, later on. So if we could manage this as part of the project, we developed the textbook, 30 schools were covered, we had respective lessons, 150 or 200 children learned something. Is it success? Yes. But since we work with organization and we we saw some prospects of future development over the last 10 years, we developed an online for, uh, platform. We have a, a four online courses and one in more than several thousand schools uh, are our partners now. And we so we we did it and we spread and we share this experience. Even in terms of war, uh, we spread this experience, and more than 200 schools have been cooperating with us. And children are learning some practical uh, skills of uh, in energy efficiency sector and using the scarcity of photo that we have. So, thank you very much for your attention. Ruslan, thank you. I mean, the one. Um... One of the most important takeaways I have from, from this experience is, again, you're talking about a shift from a more systemic approach where you were having sort of maybe longer term um, support that was supporting the work that you were already doing to more of a more traditional project approach where I believe you were saying, and we've talked about this before, um, where there was less investment in the local organizations and the Ukrainian organizations Instead, you would see international organizations hiring on staff on for their projects, Ukrainian experts, 
But because of the, the transactional time, the time it takes to get a new project up and running, you talk about losing, having lost in a year or more in that process of having to shift between project to project. Whereas when you when you had more ongoing funding that was supporting you directly, supporting the work you were doing, that you know you didn't lose time, you were able to leverage the expertise you already had, and be more flexible when the war hit. Um, this question of you know you've talked about how municipal development doesn't end just because there's a war, and you, this sort of rupture between an immediate you know, humanitarian response versus the ongoing development and the ongoing needs of, of youth um, and, and children in those communities. And with that more flexible multi-year funding of the work that you're already doing, you're better positioned to respond in those circumstances. And I think that's a really important lesson for, for, for all of us. And so Min, over to you, I'm gonna ask you actually sort of um, this question and then the follow-on question, which is, Again, how does the funding support or not support your strategic priorities as SVF? And then also, if you can tell, tell us um, what were some of the most important capacity strengthening um, opportunities that SVF was able to take advantage of in order to do more of the work that you wanted to do? Um, and also some of the lessons learned, perhaps, from some of those past experiences. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. In the work that SVF is doing right now, we mostly focus on capacity strengthening. Um, from the point of view of donors, I think that they are being quite updated with the uh, local needs. For example, you can support in innovation in digital transformation, business model building. These are the things that are supporting localities um, in having more access to dialogue and in access to markets. I think that um, you are supporting on the right thing, but I think you also provide on top of that very good methodology. Um, you have very strong NEL system. Having access to these things it helped us to have a better view on strategies. At the same time, the gap is that you only show us the what. You don't show us the how. How do we actually do that? How do we actually arrive there? So when we take those tools, we have to localize it. We have to adapt it. When you go and work with a locality, you work with a province, we have to start with their needs. And we have to adapt the model, the design uh, that was given by the donor. But the donor come with a very fixed, rigid model. And, and so we have to engage other donors so that we can build up new models for them that works really for them. Um, so that is really um, co-design before you implement it. For us, we take that model, we have to remodel it. And in order for us to remodel it, we have to go out and find other donors or we have to find other sources of funds. So that, that's something that we had to deal with. Secondly, we had to ourselves strengthen our own capacity because we have uh, to work with, um, we, we work with the higher level but you imagine that in Vietnam, the central level and the provincial levels are very different. When you go to a province, they will have different approach. They will have different um, environments. While with the central level, it's all the same. Therefore, when we go to the provinces, um, we have to have different approach. And when we go to central level, we have to adjust it again. We have to change it again. Um, and overall, you have to understand that in Vietnam, in order to work with the province, you have to work with the, the central level first, and then you go down to the, um, the, to the province level. So it's very hard for us if we are not involved in the design stage of the, of the project, and it's hard for us. And later on, we know that the project is very fixed and then the project is limited in terms of the time that you run, the years that you run. 
So uh, we later on have to do those tasks alone. So I think that there has to be a change in the term of the project and flexibility of the projects for us. Um, right now, how do we operate uh, for, uh, the project with USAID that already closed? But now we also want to work with this province and that province. So we have to think about fundraising. We have to think about other donors and that's so much work. And I, I still want to say at the same time that we're happy. Uh, it's a journey of finding a companion on, on this journey. And so, so that's the answer for the first question, whether there is a match. It, there is a match, but there is not 100% a match um, because your tools or your uh, know-how, it doesn't match 100% uh, at the local level. And we have to localize that. We have to adjust that at our own budget. And we really appreciate all of the time and the resources that you uh, have brought to us through these projects. The second question is on the access and the opportunities for capacity strengthening. First, I want to say that I, I am very grateful for all of these opportunities. I shared with you that at the beginning, it was such a hard a job. We work with provinces, listen to their um, needs and where were the money? The money came from just ourselves. Uh, the businessmen and women, and then we we put we applied for grants all over the places. We did not win any grants, and we just keep putting in our own money. And it was such a fortunate thing that we was picked by uh, Kamanix to be one of the three uh, attendants in SBC project. We worked with Peter. We're so grateful for him because he showed up at the right time. At that specific moment in time, when you send experts to work with us on business model, on MEL, uh, market needs assessment, and finance, marketing, strategy, up until 2022, we were able to win our first grant. And, and thanks to SBC, the four the biggest impact that we got first was that we got a very clear view on uh, growth strategies. Before that, we changed it over and over every uh, half year. But here, now we have a very clear strategy. We don't change it anymore. Previously, we have zero funding, but now, until now, we have some uh, grants that is $300,000, $400,000, and that's wonderful. Secondly, we're so much stronger in methodology. We are supporting uh, provinces, and provinces have quite organized governance systems. And when we come in, we have to have a strong methodology in order to persuade them to follow us. And third, we were supported in terms of MEL. So we can measure our impacts. We know when to make an adjustment, when to make a change in our way of doing things. And with that, we can support these um, localities in a way in a way that is better. Uh, initially, we didn't think about green development or equality or sustainable development. But now we are incorporating GSC and sustainability into our program as provinces. And therefore we operate on a more international level. These are the uh, opportunities that we got access to through these, through this project. And for us, you ask us, what do we need more? What do we want more? I think please continue to empower us, to trust us so that we can be more involved in design. So it will be an open design. What we learned was that when you 
when you do your design, you get us a what? What skills? What know how? However, it 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 doesn't work if the beneficiary or the organization like us don't really understand how. Second, what attitude do you have when you do those things? How are you going to deliver those what? Um, so you have to empower us with the capacity that you are building in us. So that the thing that we want more involvement in design, more um, engagement, more empowerment since the earlier uh, phases so that we don't have to redesign it um, later on. And then we have to fundraising later on. Second, we also want to be empowered to have more flexible and long-term uh, fund so that this fund can be used in a more flexible and well-matched way with the provinces that we work with. So these are the sharings that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Min. There's so many jewels of experience and advice and everything you're saying. Um, a, a couple of things that I'm hearing. So the first question in terms of funding, um, you know, it depends also on the stage of, of, of your journey, right? So in the beginning, when you had a lot of enthusiasm from your initial local donors and your local, um, your founders, and, and then looking for funding and, and have finding it hard to, 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 to find support at that point. And then when the funding does come, I'm also hearing you talking about multiple donors and having to, um, you know, having to respond to different methodologies as you were talking about. I, I would understand that means probably both administrative methodologies, but also technically, right? Um, different donors coming with, well, this is how we do it. And I'm also hearing you say that um, even those methodologies, when they are quite helpful, um, you get to see what maybe international standards are, you still then have to do that process of adapting to make that make sense. You've talked about how donors might come with the right alignment in terms of um, everyone agreeing on the ultimate objectives. And so that there's alignment that they understand <clears throat> and have good objectives or what they're trying to achieve. But you all know realistically how that might actually be achieved in, in each of the, the provinces and each of the municipalities. And there's a translation that needs to happen oftentimes that you all, that SVF plays um, to need to adapt those methodologies so that they actually will work in the local context, right? Um, you're also talking about um, the, the design stage and it would save a lot of time if perhaps you were more engaged in different ways. And we know that this is part of what USAID is, is, tending, is trending towards now of, of greater engagement from the very beginning, as you're saying. Um, great. Well, we have a, a little bit more time for a, a couple of more responses before we open up for the q and I see that there are questions coming in. Please continue to put questions in the Q&A. We will open up um, to, to, to for have you be able to pose your questions directly to these panelists. Um, so I think I'm going to turn it over to you, Maroon, for this question of, um, again, capacity strengthening. For the, the the opportunities that you that uh, that Afwa has been able to engage in, what what of those opportunities have has been most helpful? Maybe perhaps what's been least helpful um, in terms of getting you to be able to do more of what you want to do, or to do it simply better, or whatever. However, you define your own capacity needs of being. Um. I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, take the example of the hiking trail that we did with the with the CSP, the Community Support Program. So um, Darib Ainibil is a project that was fully funded by the USAID and uh, uh, through the um, CSP Community Support Program. After uh, evaluating the village potential, uh, we were recommended to um, uh, to to present a uh, touristic project. Uh, this is where Alpha uh, actually got engaged by designing, implementing, and currently managing the hiking trade. The project was a, a fascinating experience. Uh, the most important element in it was the, really the building, uh, the building capacity, the capacity building workshops that uh, we did. 
this was a, a crucial component that demonstrate that the project uh, that, that demonstrates the project sustainability our team was taught all about all aspects related to the trail from the designing process at the beginning up to managing it by the end um another valuable aspect uh, was related uh, actually is re is regarding the freedom that was giving to us to execute the project as we as we see it according to our vision so this this autonomy that we were given through this project enabled us to invest the funds locally resulting in a, a locally sourced material uh, such as the design the execution of the trail furniture the information panel the content the brochure everything was made locally and this was possible because of the autonomy that we were given by the donors so um, alongside this, the CSP provided us with continue, uh, continuous support throughout the process uh, by doing a follow-up regularly. So this was a really uh, interesting uh, project for us. So uh, uh, um, in, 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 in opposition to what we had uh, elsewhere, especially the, the, the sorting one, because we had to work on all levels and most of the time we had to do research and we were we, we, we are ignorant regarding sorting and the, the, the machines and so on. So um, it took us a lot of time in order to um, figure out what we need. Uh, therefore, uh, the um, the the the, 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 the trail, the hiking trail was completely the opposite because we had a backup on all levels. And we knew that the, the donor, those who gave us the money, entrusted us with this money and we wanted to do our best and I guess the result is 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 is, is, is excellent since we um with the result we had we could we became the first network trail to the LMT Lebanon Mountain Trail which is the reference in Lebanon regarding the trails and they signed an agreement with us within a year after completing the, the trail so this expresses that the, the success that we had because they gave us money, we had ideas, and we impl implemented the project according to our vision. So it was sort of complementarity between the donor, our vision, and maybe the need. So um, our experience, at least with this project, was really enormous because it was a fully funded project. It wasn't just an idea that we had to search for it uh, all over. So this was the difference between this and other uh, big projects that we had. Yeah, thanks for that example. I'm hearing a few different things. First of all, it, it may depend the kind of assistance that you need, whether it's funding, whether it's technical um, expertise, is, is going to depend on, on the initiative, it's going to depend on the project, right? So you may just exactly. need the money, the, the right amount of money to, to complete something that you already have a vision for and you already have the expertise for. And that's where the freedom and flexibility and trust comes in. You just take that and you run with it and you, you do what you know how to do. And, and there is that followed. Right. And then the follow-up and the coaching perhaps to do the support to do that. Um, and in other cases, if you need to build a recycling plant and you don't have the, the, <laughs> the technical expertise, that happens anywhere in the world where you might have a nonprofit that wants an initiative and they're going to need to bring in some some very specific technical um, expertise, right? And so what I'm hearing is that that might depend. The kind of strengthening or funding um, may depend a lot on what you're trying to achieve. Exactly. Um, so thank you for those examples. Ruslan, over to you. Um, this question mm -hmm. about what has been the right kind of support or the right kinds of capacity strengthening um, You've talked about the frustration of moving away from more systemic support to project based, but of of the capacity strengthening that that um, the MDI has been able to take advantage of, what has worked best for you? What has been less helpful? Thank you for the working in Ukraine. We have a system, there is a system that, that organizations like our not NGOs, not for profit, the only source for development uh, are grants for for us. And uh, when, when we start the operation with grant providers uh, uh, within the framework of budget pain, we try to either through negotiations or 
Oh, oh we try we try to allocate some money for our own development, but unfortunately, the grant providers they limit themselves to to update in some technique. So together with Kimonix, we managed to procure the laptop that we used for uh, for infield seminar. We also procured the server to make sure our website and our online resources work better. And uh, but for us, but our needs are not are not limited to equipment only. We have personnel, we have experts, we have procedures to, to follow. And these manuals sh should be updated from time to time because everything is changing. The context is changing. And the legislative framework changes inside of Ukraine. So, so systemically, you, you can work with capacity building organizations. You can, if you have if you have a separate uh, budget for that, the only time we 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 cooperate directly with the ACD as part of the as part of the project in 2013 2015 um, a local alternative, alternative energy sources in the city of Midgard. So so within within this project, we had a separate budget for capacity building. And we the design the capacity building plan. So so we, we designed the capacity building plan. It included some technical uh, refurbishment and, and renewal of the software. Because from time to time you have to you have to update your software, uh, hardware, and also it included the uh, expenditures uh, for development of the of many manuals, course sharing manuals. And we developed some grant and manual. So, so we as an organization could provide some grants. Until that time, we didn't have any capacity like that. It was very difficult for us to design this uh, manual. So we had to attract professional organizations. In cooperation with them, we succeeded. And we had a training budget for professional training of our, of, of our financial manager. Yeah. So training in uh, US state changes to grant accounting. So we managed to significantly uh, improve the capacity of our organization. And uh, so, so it would be good that that is part of the as a, as part of the some separate component we as a, we were able based on the real needs organization to 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 increase our capacity uh, uh international capacity because the the greater the the efficient is the 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 great the greater is the efficiency the greatest capacity, the, the more successful uh, the projects are implemented, regardless of the war, uh, the, all the projects were performed. And we managed to fulfill not just because we were lucky, just because we had a professional team, we had a professional approach, and we have practices, the procedures that are developed and that we stick to. And that and we have a planning system we have a budgeting system in place we designed uh, as part of the capacity building plan that i mentioned we designed the uh, software that helps us to online to, to fill uh, a lot of documents online that had to be done in a paper form in the, in the time of the war this is the only chance for uh, the only chance for effective coordination of of uh, activity of our consultants' performance. Uh, so we take into account all the grant providers' uh, requirements. And before that, it was very difficult for us to do. Mm -hmm. Now we, it helps us, it's the only mechanism 
uh, for teaching and cooperation uh, under war. And uh, so we, so, so this grant component for capacity building scale is very much needed. Another important uh, aspect is the, is the uh, to be able to receive uh, some grants for sustainable development. For instance, we developed a program product, a software product, or or chatbot that helps people to get consultation. And we we try to use it further on, but we need time. We need we need to find either a new donor who will help us. Uh, we're not we're not commercial organization. We don't receive money for that. So we cannot do that as part of the Ukrainian legislation. So all this activity is changed. We get results. But if you can, these results continue on, they, this is this is result that there is an aim of the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Ruslan, thank you. Um, so I have a couple, again, important points in what I'm hearing from what you're saying. So first of all, that strengthening of your organization, it's not just capacity strengthening and in terms of technical capacity, right? There's a there's a aspect of strengthening your organization as an organization that can go forward and do more and do more with the same amount of money, right? The efficiency part of what you're talking about. So you're talking about what we say brass tacks, just basic things like some basic equipment in order to do your job, being able to have the right procedures that are updated with the, the latest laws um, and be able to yourself take on the role of giving grants to smaller organizations. So it's not just about the, the technical methodologies that are also very important in a lot of ways, but also strengthening you as an organization so that when you get that flexible funding, you can do more with it. And I know that, that um, you've talked about that as being one of your top recommendations to donors is allow for that systemic approach, allow for that flexibility, set aside specific funds is also what you're saying, focus specifically on organizational development moving forward to allow you to be able to, to do that work more. Um, we're going to move to questions in just one second, but um, I just want to get and an, an Min's takeaway also in terms of your recommendations. What I heard from what you were saying before is involve us sooner <laughs> in the design, right? Um, perhaps allow for more flexibility in terms of how how you adapt different methodologies that donors would want to to see you using, right? Um, and have that all of that start earlier because you all know how what it's going to actually take to achieve the ultimate objectives in your context, right? Maroon, do you have one last word? If you have like thirty seconds for what your top recommendations would be to different aid um, agencies and international organizations looking to to support groups like yours. Oh, um, your microphone. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. So uh, our recommendation stands with the idea of the pan local capacity strengthening. We think that for a small NGO like ours, huh, that donors should follow up and assess the performance of their implementing projects after a while, let's say several years, evaluate the tools to improve the quality of the work by bringing more technical support and expertise thus switching from building the capacity into strengthening it. So when you say building is one workshop at the beginning and that's it, strengthening, let's repeat it. Let's say several release raters after assessing the, the, the project. Right, great, thanks. And actually I'll have you kick us off with some of the questions coming in from the audience too. Um, you're getting some questions on this, this, this aspect of working with local government, which I know that on SBF you all are doing that too. Of course, um, MDI also. Through, through different international programs, how, how best um, have you been able to work with local government given that on their end too, their resources um, are often very, very limited and, and particularly in Lebanon where, um, or in Ukraine also, 
where there's an ongoing crisis. So what are some of the best practices that you all have, have had in terms of that ecosystem strengthening, including local government? Marim. This question is for me. Yes. Yeah, in terms of your your um, good ex your best best practices, your helpful practices when you've worked with local government there. Well, um, to to be honest, we we had to impose ourselves upon the uh, 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 organizational scene, if I can, on the on the civic scene. So uh, when when we started at the beginning, we we were doing our project for our own. And after a while, we were we have been we were being noticed by the, the the municipality. Therefore, they started calling upon us. We didn't impose ourselves, so we made ourselves as a um, a must to play with player on the on the local scene. So we started by small project implemented or uh, 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 um, made by us. And then the municipality did notice our work, and therefore uh, this was the easiest door actually to collaborate with the municipality, at least from our end. It's a completely different story. We started, you know, as just a will of a group of youth, and later on we started participating into a much wider activity, which is um, working all together with the municipality. Great, thank you. There's another question coming in for all of you um, in terms of this goes back to what Ruslan you were talking about in terms of overall organization strengthening. And the question is um, coming in from Leslie Mitchell. Um, this, does, do any of you struggle with some of the limitations that they have that project based funding has in terms of the percentage of overhead or general and administrative funds that you all have that helps you get between project to project that helps you sustain your staff, your staffing, build your organization, apply for the next round of funding. Is there a, is there a more, is there a need for more than just sort of the, the, the typical 10%? Sort of a leading question I can imagine. Min, do you wanna take that one? I I can I can answer that question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, well, our grants are usually are pinpointed grants and uh, the target grants, so the grant money uh, aimed at achieving the, the results of the project. Of course, there are some overheads for for administrative needs or ensuring the needs of organization like like uh, rent pay, rental communication mobile uh, internet but the expenditures uh such expenses cannot always be included in the budget for instance if we it's the matter of the of course it's the matter of negotiations with the grant with the grantor if it's possible we we'll try to include the procurement of the equipment like laptop that is used for for seminars, but but it's but but separate separate expenses for development of qualities or professional development cannot be included without with without negotiation previous negotiations with the grantor and the international organizations they they are very reluctant you know to to include grant or include a developer component in their grant and so we so we will we work as a we develop our organizations volunteers we design some software or we are we are we train ourselves at our own expenses and you know this is is it doesn't always it's not always a good idea because it's very difficult to allocate external uh, finances right. for our own development. 
that makes sense. And so sort of your own internal training and, and human resource development, which is probably an ongoing thing, right? Since as you get new staff that comes on board, upskilling as a continuous process, and it's hard to find the funding to support you to do that. That makes a lot of sense. Min, did you want to weigh in on that on that question in terms of um, overall organization strengthening and the funding to do that? Min, over to you. Jennifer, I think this is a wonderful question. And here we have a lot of um, NPOs and NGOs and designers of projects. I want to share a little bit more on how to build relationships with provinces. This is my experience in Vietnam. There are two paths for you to go here. First one, for them, it's most important to reach consensus because with the cat with government, especially in Vietnam, consensus is very important. When they see that there is an agreement uh, among communities, uh, among organizations, when people and when businesses agree with what the government wants, then that's what's important to them. Second, uh, during your design, you have to focus on implementation because mostly they are strong on policy, but they are not strong on implementation, especially on uh, provincial level, because provincial level, they need to implement the policies, but they don't really have that uh, competence to do that. For us, we, we are a bridge in order to come in and support them with implementing policies. The second question on overheads and grants, honestly, we have never seen any grants provider that would sponsor us with the activities that we are doing, except for USAID, who are providing uh, a program for us as a beneficiary, but we have never uh, received any other fundings as as an intermediary organization. So we are the beneficiary. We provide experts to other service provider. We are the experts provider, and we see one of the challenges that we're facing here is that when you design your project, there are cost norms. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard for us to invite top-notch experts. If, if they are local experts and there are very low budgets for them. And the reality is that they are local, but they are excellent. They are brilliant, but they do, we don't have the right norm to pay for them. And we feel that there is discrimination here between international expert and local expert. So this is another point that I want to weigh in. I don't think that you should discriminate it like that. The most important thing is for um, us to find an expert that is the right match and to really make these local experts feel respected. So that's, that's the input that I really want to make. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, man. That's a great thing to end on in terms of the, the expertise that's available locally. I know you've spoken in the past um, of an appreciation of the international expertise you can get from folks who come in, but you've also talked about how they come into Vietnam for a matter of time, for sometimes days only, um, barely even a week or two. And um, the time it takes to get them up to speed for contextually what makes sense um, while there is a benefit to that, certainly taking advantage as much as possible of the of the expertise that you already have in country that comes both with technical and context expertise and to be able to use both of that and have the funding flexibility to be able to to leverage that expertise, pay what's due for beyond your organization 
but truly the whole ecosystem again of expertise around that. So I want to thank you all so very much. Um, we're at the, the end of the panel. I'd like to invite all of you to um, take a look at the questions that have come in in the Q&A. There are a couple of additional ones. If you're able to respond there, I'm sure people would appreciate it. Um, and I just we just want to thank you all so much for, it's very late where most of you are right now, for taking the time to come to speak to, with us. Um, I think it's very important to hear from you all directly on these matters. And I know that you've given a lot of people um, a lot of a lot of things to think about. We shared the results of the poll to let let folks know where, where folks are calling in from. Um, and we about 50% of international organizations who I'm sure are taking very good note of everything you are saying. Um, I hope that's true for the donors on the call and also from other organizations, regional, national, local organizations who are um, acting very much in the same way that you all are in terms of being important leaders in their own communities and seeing the solidarity between your experiences. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to our, our final reflection here, um, welcoming on um, David Jacobstein, who is um, on the policy coordination and integration team at the USA DRG Center. Um, and my colleague, Krishna, um, Krishnik Partishi, who's from Kamonix and the chief of party of our USAID um, Kosovo economic growth activity. And to invite you both um, to reflect on all of these important experiences that we've been hearing from our panelists. Um, and I think I'll start with, with you, Krishnik. As a leader um, in your own right, um, in your own country, in your own community, in what ways do you see the successes and struggles and experiences of these local organizations and national organizations reflected in your own experience? Um, and what do you think are some of the best ways that international organizations and donors can support the work that they're doing? Uh, thank you, Jennifer. So um, having having heard the presentations from all three organizations, I think the uh, continued self-reliant engagement and commitment of these organizations in their respective areas is what uh, all USAID funded, funded projects uh, that I've worked with have aspired to. Um, I will start with an example from Kosovo, which will tie the rest of my comments uh, and reflections uh, on uh, the presentations from the three organizations. So uh, the, the majority of our work within the project uh, that we have in Kosovo right now with civil society, private sector and local organizations is uh, is done to support the program for the legalization of unpermitted constructions, where our project, the uh, USAID Kosovo Economic Governance Activity, has uh, built a coalition of over 16 civil society. Uh, many organizations, many focusing on rights of non-majority communities and women's empowerment and private sector organizations, such as the Kosovo Banks Association, that have voluntarily worked with our project to support uh, this important program for security, securing property rights of citizens and boosting economic growth. This work has been volunt voluntary from civil society and, uh, and private sector organizations who are often taking the lead in supporting Kosovo citizens in particular municipalities to complete the legalization program. Our project's uh, role in this particular case, it was the evaluation of, uh, of our project that uh, uh, the best contribution that we could give uh, to, to the engagement of these organizations was to provide them with the training and the promotional materials where the, whereas most of the actual field work is being done by voluntarily by civil society organizations and, and private sector organizations. So our consistent messaging throughout this effort has been that Legalizing even a single building is a, is a success, and this uh, this re this reflects what Maroon said earlier about their efforts in southern Leban Lebanon, where uh, uh, essentially the 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 way that uh, the engagement is communicated is in terms of very specific tangible. Uh, tangible benefits for the citizens of that specific community, such as such as the the jobs, the five jobs that were created for the five families in in the village in Lebanon. So uh, I've often been asked the question in Kosovo, uh, why are these local organizations supporting these efforts voluntarily? Why are the, why, why why are they doing this? Uh, and when this is not the case in many other areas, uh, 
And I think uh, one of the key reasons uh, goes back to something noted in principle four of the USAID local capacity strengthening policy, which highlights the importance of aligning capacity strengthening with local priorities. And I mean very local priorities at, 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 at the very local level. And the clear understanding of the impact that USAID funded projects can have to strengthen local capacities and increase local impact and influence beyond the traditional approaches and beyond traditional counterparts. Uh, beyond traditional NGOs and private sector organizations that we work with. Uh, so uh, as for the question on uh, what are the best ways to support uh, local organizations, I think this is highly contextual, depending on depending on the country, uh, depending on the respective country. And uh, here, I would like to echo Ms. Laura Pavlovich's previous remark and stress the importance of incorporating local capacity strengthening throughout the life cycle of development interventions, starting crucially at the design phase um, and onward throughout implementation. So finally, I also want to echo uh, the comments from uh, Ming, Ming, Ming Le Hong on the importance of tailoring the approaches and particularly the messaging, depending on whether organizations are working at the central or the local level. This is something that we've found very important for coalition building uh, with civil society organizations and private sector. And it ties back also to comments from Maroon earlier, where, uh, so whereas referring to larger scale objectives works at the central level, at the very local level, the messaging has to be adapted to the community level, talking in terms of specific jobs, in terms of specific, uh, specific buildings legalized, specific things that have an actual impact in the daily, in the daily lives of, of people. This has helped us enormously to, to build, this, build and nurture these coalitions at, at, at the very local level. Um, so uh, this tailored messaging approach is crucial, in my opinion, for, for developing uh, these coalitions. Um, one final thing that I would like to note is the importance of, um, and this was mentioned by, by uh, this was sort of mentioned by, by Ming in her presentation, is the importance of uh, uh, making sure from, from, from an implementer's perspective, uh, making sure that uh, we're not only supporting the civil society organizations and, the the, and strengthening the local capacities, their local capacities, but also working on the broader ecosystem and making sure that, uh, their, that their contributions are recognized and are taken into account by the governments, both at the, both at the local level and at the central level, because uh, it is often my experience in, in, uh, from Kosovo uh, that uh, this is not often recognized by, I mean, the role of civil society organizations and private sector organizations and, and the contribution that they can give for the successful implementation of reforms and activities that, that, uh, that benefit people's lives is often not recognized by the governments until they actually see those specific results. And I think this is where this is where uh, implementing partners and uh, and USAID in particular uh, can can have a very tangible role in in, ma in making sure that that uh, uh, to making sure and building this connection between between these organizations and, and the respective governments. Again, depending on the particular context. So that's all I have for now. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, these connections of looking at the system, the ecosystem, and all the roles of the, the different sectors, the public sector, the nonprofit, the private sector, the academic sector, and thinking of local capacity strengthening as systemic, as Laura was saying. And so over to you, David, I mean, what, what were some of your, your main takeaways from what you heard? How do you think that relates to some of the things that Laura is talking about in terms of the next steps in oper operationalizing the local capacity strengthening policy? So uh, first of all, just a huge appreciation. This is um, really um, fantastic, profound, detailed, wonderful um, reflections and thoughts to be um, to be hearing and to be able to um, take into account as we uh, consider what we're doing. Um, I mean, some of this I think really illustrates things that we have have known but need to be borne out and need to be expressed more concretely. Um, you know, Ruslan talking about the, the costs of um, not just kind of repeated projects, everybody spoke about kind of projects start up and shut down and the timeframes for them, um, but kind of the um, more broadly that this, 
this fails to sustain um, directions of work because of shifts in either who is supporting or how donors are are um, oriented. And uh, you know, there there may be reasons for this, but I think we need to be more cognizant of that as a potential cost and as something that um, is problematic. But I think the big take away the top line message for me that is most important, I really think, uh, thank you to Min for, for this, um, came through in, you know, we often think of capacity strengthening, um, even kind of in light of the, the USAID LCS policy and otherwise, as kind of being very open to how we can provide assistance to organizations so that they can accomplish what they want. Um, I think it's really refreshing to hear uh, you know, local organizations say, we're here to try to help you bumbling around and not understanding our provinces or exactly how things work in our cultures or who to talk to to get things done. Um, we're the helpers here and you're the ones who need us. Um, I think that that's absolutely true and we very easily lose sight of it. Um, and, and understanding that kind of shifts the discourse a little bit um, around what is our joint capacity to ensure that that the right things are getting done and you know and how can uh, you know local partners help international actors to realize what they're trying to do with the programming that they're putting in um, and I think connected to that is um, you know and I think very much connected to what Laura's talking about you know she she spoke about how we're trying to move beyond kind of definitional funk, uh, forms of, you know, of, of uh, democracy and rights and governance and really get at the underlying functions and the different ways that those happen. And one of them, uh, you know, around, um, say, civil society, um, is that the, the core purposes that those organizations have are not to uh, achieve objective X, Y, Z. It's really um, to help and to contribute, I think, um, you know, uh, Martin really gave some great illustrations of saying, okay, well, what about this? And we could take this and we could push energy in that direction um, in ways that really interact with and inspire and, and get, you know, community involvement. And I think it behooves all of us to view kind of those um, core aims and understandings in a less abstract sense and more in a you know, our purpose is to be there and to help and to continue helping as really setting the agenda for what we're trying to do when we talk about in, you know, at the grand level of a democracy, civil society mattering. I think this relates to what Krushnik was just saying in terms of without the specific stories, without the specific connections to government, there's kind of a generalized sense of, of course, civil society matters, but not a real understanding of how that translates into we need to help these particular groups doing what they're doing and not worry so much about what might they be choosing to do in two or three years, because they're better placed to know what are the right things to do than we are. Um, and so I think that has all kinds of implications for how we select and maintain partnerships, but more deeply for what we understand as the agenda, as what it means to strengthen and support, uh, you know, civil society and, and local organizations. Um, uh, then one other thing that I just wanted to reflect on um, that I think came across a number of these as, as uh, you know, as everyone was telling the story of how their organizations kind of grew over time, um, that we can miss the value of small investments that really can allow renewal and growth and can, um, you know, allow some diversity, different, different voices to come in, different voices to be heard. Um, I think we are often so focused on um, the accomplishments that animate why we have funding in the first place that um, I think we we sometimes discount, um, you know, and it is possible, it is possible to do some small investments at the margins of any kind of program. Um, and I think that they pay off in ways that we can't always foresee. Um, and, you know, I think just bearing in mind that the capacities, I think we know this and the policy reflects this, but the capacity that it takes to make a difference in a community, to, to make a difference in a development sense, is a, a spirit. It's a sense of, of you know, in, in a, it's heart. It's, it's kind of a set of um, beliefs and approaches and, and having the drive and dedication. It's not really a set of skills. 
Um, again, I think we we know that, but can miss the implications of what that means. I I do think that the the policy has some useful language around understanding that that who you know matters more than what you know, and that it's about accompaniment, not training. It's not a set of tasks that we know that people need help with, and then um, enabling them to do those so much as uh, creatively thinking about how to bring somebody who can give an example or connect groups with peer groups where they can share experiences or have exchanges or all kinds of things like that. So I think we have more latitude than we realize to do some of that. Um, and I think for the non-donor audiences out there, one thing that I think is often opaque in how we operate that I would like to make clear for everyone is one of the reasons that some of these things remain hard for us is often that there's it is very um, fraught to ensure that that we as a donor will continue to have funding to provide to continue to do good work year on year. Um, and a lot of the push toward needing to have, um, you know, clear objectives or certainty of results or other things that can really be problematic um, come from people who are trying their best to say we want to to know that we'll be able to keep doing good work. And so this is kind of the bargain we're striking. And I think part of how we all have to evolve is to say, as we understand results differently, as we change our, our mentality around what matters in terms of, at least in my sector, in, in democracy, human rights, and governance, um, can we count more of those things as results? And can we um, then, you know, make space to kind of say that's what we will get credit for so that we can keep supporting this good work and i think one of the signs i take heart in is how many pointers in that direction exist um, and i think we need to kind of um, take courage as donors and as partners but i think also um, for the frustrated on the outside it, some of it comes from good places and from people trying to defend funding that they see doing good work um, but it's a bad bargain and we need to evolve beyond it um, but mostly just to say thank you for for the ideas, the inspiration, and the sense that um, that yes, you can help us. You have helped us, I hope, um, through giving these examples, um, and that that really needs to be the basis of the relationship that donors and outsiders have within country actors. Is to say, uh, we need you. Um, could you help us to do things? And in collectively doing those things. Um, can we strengthen each other or can we find ways to um, invest in you because we know it will pay off for us? Um, so I, I think those are all, for me, really vital takeaways for us to to um, go further in terms of how we carry out, uh, you know, how we think about our work and how it relates to capacity strengthening and accomplishing results. Yeah, thanks, David. I mean, I think what you're what you're getting at is trying to get to a more concrete definition of mutuality, right? We've been talking about this word, but ultimately, what does that what does that look like? And I and 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 that cooperation again. Yes, we're trying to provide you assistance to do what you want to do that you are already achieving in your communities. But we have foreign policy goals. The U.S. government has foreign policy goals in the different countries in which we work. Cooperation goals where um, we'd like to support the achievement of sustainable development, for instance, um, of well-being, of peace and stability, of democracy. And so in, 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 in total honesty, right, those are our goals. We have goals in, in around the world as well as global citizens. And so we are in this together. And so that mutuality of, yes, there are certain things that we, we can do to support you all, but you all are also going to have to support us and let's see what common goals we can achieve together. And that point that Min has brought up in the past about, about heart, right? So there's the, there's the technical expertise, there's the procedural stuff that Ruslan talked about, there's purely getting the equipment and the overhead that you need. But ultimately, you know, how, how are we getting to that heart of, you know, good people doing good work for their communities? And how can we support that? And Krishna, I would just turn it over to you, perhaps for a last word on that. Um, any reflections on what David is saying? And Concretely, how do you get to that idea of mutuality as, as you all are, are actually achieving right now in Kosovo? Uh, well, I think um, 
in terms of the macro picture of course i mean this this uh, this can and ha has been achieved and can further be achieved in the future through uh, by making sure that uh, the priorities uh, and the objectives of civil society organizations and local actors are taken into account during the design stage of, of interventions um, and um, and in terms of accommodating those foreign policy goals that you mentioned with uh, with the actual with with the actual developments in in the respective context um, in terms of uh, adapting into individual interventions um, as i explained earlier we had an example in the, in the case of kosovo where essentially we launched a, a, a partnership program invited all civil society organizations in kosovo asked everybody whether they're interested in supporting this uh, uh, this particular intervention and ultimately we ended up with uh, 16 that were and uh, then uh, worked with those 16 to to push forward uh, that uh, that particular agenda and in essence it I, I could say it was even a challenge to the part to the civil society and, and and private sector in kosovo in terms of if you think that for example property rights are important then come help us help you and let's help the citizens together um so no, I mean, it's tremendous because, I mean, it, it's it, the, the very premise was around this idea of collaborating around something that you're already doing that already it means yes. something to you, right? Yes, yes. So it's not yeah. about the funding from the very beginning. It's about a common interest where um, we each have something to contribute. And it's across the entire ecosystem again, right? So something we talk about here um, a, a lot is, you know, who's, whose job is it to do the things already in that ecosystem? Who's already doing it? And who could be doing that more? So what's the government role, inherently government role in, for a particular objective, like in this in this case, right? What's the private sector's role? How can they be doing more of what they should be doing, the nonprofit, the academic? And a lot of countries around the world, I mean, those, those sectors might look a little bit different, but there is sort of an inherent complementarity there, right? So if we're a donor or an international partner, from Commonics perspective, locally led development for us really means you know, what is the role that we can play to support the actors who are already in that ecosystem? And, you know, if, if we're if we're the stewards of government funding from, from USAID or from UK, how can we nurture those relationships so there is that mutuality so that organizations on the ground who are already doing this great work can help also advance those other foreign, foreign policy objectives, but in a way that's already strengthening the grain that we all are aligned with, and there's multiple grains, right? I mean, David, you have colleagues on your team that talk about, well, and the question came up in the chat, what if what if the grain, the predominant grain goes against our values, goes against our objectives, as in this case, the US government, right? Um, and I think the answer has often been, there are already organizations going along another grain that are aligned with our values. How do we identify them and work with them? And as Laura was saying, ultimately try to overcome some power imbalances that we would like to see change, right? We're at time. I'd like to thank both you, um, David and Kreshnik, for your final reflections. I think that helps us process all of what we heard really well. I'd like to thank again all of our panelists and um, Laura in the beginning. And I think we've been giving information on these organizations in the chat as well so that you can learn more about what they all are doing. And again, for us here at Commonics, this is just a chance for us to be able to hand the microphone over to folks who are actually doing this work. We talk about, to be honest, here in Washington, D.C., we talk about you all a lot. <laughs> what are local organizations doing? And so to be able to have you actually come talk to us and be able to share your um, experiences was incredibly powerful. I hope that um, that more organizations will, will do more of this, USAID and its um, pursuit of the local capacity strengthening and locally led development, the new, um, the target that we'll all be hearing more about, at least 50% of activities that include um, more design um, engagement from the very beginning, that we can all start to create um, a, a real, real momentum towards true locally led development in the ways that you all are already achieving. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone one more time, including everyone in the audience. Um, you see some questions coming up. These are at least questions for thought for David and Kreshnik and for the panelists as you continue on in your work. 
Um, and this has been recorded. So we, we do look forward to ongoing reflections around all of this. So thank you all again. We'll see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you all. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.